In this episode of Influencers, journalist and Hollywood ending author, Ken Aletta. To do a book is at least a three-year commitment. So it, it, in that sense, it's like a marriage. You want to be sure you're in love before you take the plunge. One of the problems that, in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein scandal is we tend to group everyone together. I'm interested in what, how was this kept suppressed for so many decades that he was abusing women? Who are the enablers and how did they enable him to do that? Hello everyone and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer and welcome to our guest Ken Aletta, noted author, media critic for The New Yorker whose latest book is Hollywood Ending, Harvey Weinstein and the Culture of Silence. Ken, great to see you. Thanks, Andy. So let's start by talking about the Weinstein book. Why did you decide to write a book about these guys? Well, I had profiled Harvey Weinstein in 2002 for The New Yorker and I wrote about his monstrous behavior in terms of abusing staff, throwing ashtrays at people, a reporter in a headlock. But I couldn't nail him on what I had heard was true but couldn't prove, which is that he abused, sexually abused women. I confronted him with a question of, of did he rape Rowena Chu at the 1998 Venice Film Festival? He denied it. I couldn't get Rowena Chu or the other person who was with her to acknowledge it. Uh, so it was a question of Harvey denying it and no one affirming it. So we, in the New Yorker, we couldn't run that story. But I stayed on that case. I went back at him in 2015 when an Italian model for the first time went public with an accusation that he abused her. Couldn't nail that. The DA decided not to prosecute. Uh, in 2017, when Ronan Farrow was reporting on Harvey Weinstein for NBC, he came to me, interviewed me. And I said, oh my God, I think this guy may have the goods finally. I said, what do you got, Ronan? He said, I've got three women on camera by name saying he sexually abused them. I've got five women on camera but shielded, their identity is shielded, saying he sexually abused me. And I got the Italian model from 2015 acknowledging in an audio tape that, that Harvey grabbed my breasts. I said, you've broken the case. What's the next step? He said, I, I meet with the president of NBC News, Noah Oppenheim, on August 8th. I called him on August 9th. I said, so how'd you do? Thinking, you know, finally the story's going to be broken. And he said, they fired me, and they're not running the story. They said, I don't have the goods. And so I went to NBC in reporting my book, and, and they said he didn't have the goods until he went to The New Yorker. He broke The New Yorker story in October of 2017. Yet I went back to the editor, Deirdre, who was editing him for The New Yorker, and I said, Deirdre, when he came to you in August, what did he bring? And she said he brought three women on camera, five women unnamed but claiming that Harvey abused him, and the audio tape from the Italian model. I said, my God, he had it. So in my book, I decided to go to the bottom of that. One of the things I wanted to get to the bottom of was what happened. NBC denied it. Yet I learned that they told Harvey Weinstein a week, be, a week before they told Ronan Farrow his story was dead, they told Harvey Weinstein the story was dead, which I think is a kind of a scandal. So anyway, I set out to do the book thinking, I'm interested in what, how was this kept suppressed for so many decades that he was abusing women? Who were the enablers and how did they enable him to do that? What is the nature of Harvey Weinstein's power? That he could, so in a, in a way the book became a portrait of power and how you use and abuse it. What made him the monster he became? Did something happen in his childhood, in his early life that might explain what he did? So I said, and what was his talent? I mean, here's a guy who won 81 Academy Awards. He wasn't just a monster, he was also a talented movie maker. So I said, I'm going to do a full biography, but I'm also going to answer these, try to answer these mysteries. A lot of things to jump off there. First of all, I want to sort of correct something I said. I said Weinstein's plural, these guys. This is about Harvey. Bob, his brother, was in the business, but very much was not a part of this. But I, I, I put them together, Ken, because I remember in Fortune magazine, where I worked for many years, 
we did a story about worst bosses going I'm, back decades, and I it was the that. two of them. Yes, it right. Was. Bob, Bob was 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 as Harvey was to employees could be brutal. He became an alcoholic at some point, and he went to therapy. And out of that therapy, he became a better human being, more introspective, et cetera. In the end, uh, he wasn't a perfect human being, but in the end, Bob Weinstein fired his brother Harvey, his closest and his co-equal partner in business, and, and no longer speaks to him. How emblematic is Harvey Weinstein, um, Ray Hollywood, and how much of him is just a standalone monster, or is it both? It, it, it's both in the, fol in, in the sense that, that there's a long tradition of the so-called casting couch in Hollywood, where famous men or powerful men uh, seduce and, and take advantage of younger, attractive women. But there's a difference between the casting couch, seduction, if you will, or abuse, uh, harassment abuse, and rape. Harvey was raping women. And that's an extreme. And that's an extreme that was not as nearly as common in Hollywood. I think we all recognize today that the casting couch is bad too, though, right? Absolutely. And, and, and Harvey Weinstein, as part of his legacy, when he was exposed in October of 2017, it gave a great boost to Me Too, the Me Too movement and, and, and to the exposure of other men who had abused women, famous men you know, who had abused women who came out and were exposed. And so Harvey, part of Harvey's legacy becomes less the movies he created and the Academy Awards he won than, than his role in, in help, helping expose not only his beastly behavior, but the beastly behavior of many other men. I didn't even really consider that, Ken, but of course, if he hadn't engaged in this behavior, he'd be remembered as one of the most important film producers of our time, by far. I mean, maybe the best, most incredible, right? If you think about the movies he brought to the screen, I mean, Pulp Fiction, My Left Foot, The Crying Game, Shakespeare in Love, The English Patient. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's quite extraordinary. And he had a real talent. Harvey could read a script. He was much, much more knowledgeable about movies than the so-called suits of of Hollywood studios. He really knew movies and, and, and read scripts and read books and, and was a brilliant marketer and actually, believe it or not, had charm when he wanted to turn it on. He knew how to seduce people. You've written so many books about people and companies, businesses, etc. How common is it that people are that brilliant but that flawed? Well, I mean, the worst human being I've ever profiled was Roy Cohn, hmm. for instance. Uh, flawed, he, he was beyond flawed. I mean, he was, he was evil in some ways, and yet he was brilliant. And, and so it, it's not uncommon to see the flip side of the same person. Uh, but the evilness of what Harvey did to women, it, it's incomparable. I mean, it's, you know, you can think of brutal people who do brutal things and unconscionable things. Uh, but to rape over 100 women who've come out of the closet so far about Harvey? It's 100? Over 100 have come out of the closet on our, publicly. They're wow. probably more. And by the way, he, he not only was convicted in New York State criminal court at a trial I attended every day and sentenced to 23 years in prison, he goes on trial in Los Angeles in early October. 11 indictments, not the five of New York. And it's a very serious case. So he's in a wheelchair today. He's in terrible physical shape. And my guess, he'll never get out of prison. How does he stack up versus other uh, men who are guilty uh, of Me Too infractions? Well, he's, you know, he's the most extreme. I mean, one of the problems that in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein scandal is we tend to group everyone together. What Matt Lauer did at NBC mm -hmm. is not comparable to Harvey Weinstein. I'm not saying it, it, it's, it's a model behavior, it's bad behavior, but it's not, he didn't rape women. And what Al Franken, the senator who was compelled to resign, what he did is even less than, than, than what Matt Lauer did. Mike Oreskes, an editor at the AP, 
has a hard time getting a job today. I mean, he forcibly kissed a woman who came to interview him, and he, he behaved badly, you know. Mm -hmm. It was sexual harassment, but it wasn't rape. And so we have to make, uh, Larry Nasser, on the other hand, the Olympic doctor, was, was even more extreme than Harvey in, in some ways. Uh, but we, we have to be able to distinguish and make differentiation between people and their behavior and not group everyone together and, and say, if someone did something wrong, sexual harassment, forcibly kissing a woman, et cetera, and if they show contrition and they apologize and they show that they're really a different person in some ways or aiming to be a different person, then if you believe in pardons, you should believe in giving them a pardon. But it's hard for society to do that, right? Very hard. And, and it's, things are debated in Twitter, in the media, and it's very hard to stand up and say, you know what, I think that Al Franken was contrite and we should be able to allow him back in the public life. That's a difficult thing for our society to do right now. If you think, Andy, about the people who have been accused of sexual misbehavior and worse, like Harvey, the only two people that I can think of that have come back successfully from those accusations one is Bill O'Reilly, mm. whose books are bestsellers, uh, despite the fact that he, he, he paid a huge sum of money to silence women and, and, and get non-disclosure. And the other is Donald Trump, who, I mean, think about the sex tape that came out when he was running for president in 2016. His voice, you grab him by the, you know, and, and yet he's elected president of the United States and still is a very formidable presence in our society. Yeah, it's hard to know what to make of those two examples and what that means and what that says, right? Well, it, it, on the other hand, if you're Al Franken and you say, why, why aren't I allowed back in when these people who did much more egregious things than I did are allowed back in? Well, you could look at that one of two ways, which is they shouldn't be allowed back in either or you should be allowed back in. Well, I, right. think, I think Al Franken, uh, you know, th there are questions. I mean, I, uh, Jane Mayer did a brilliant piece in The New Yorker uh, about Al Franken. And there's some questions whether his behavior was, you know, wh whether he was joking or not. Right, right, I'm not right. saying, I don't know the answer to that. Right. And, and, I'm, and, and if you grab someone's or aim, act like you're going to grab someone's right. breast, that's, that's bad behavior. You shouldn't be doing that. But it is not rape right well it's a like we we're saying it's a very nuanced tricky business to adjudicate and fortunately we're not in the business of doing that right we're reporters right. and writers so we just observe no responsibility right. well right yeah although there's a lot of responsibility in what we write to get it right 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 and how do you feel about the book now um in those terms i'm pleased i mean i aim to tell a broader story that had been told before. I mean, the, the report, two reporters from the New York Times and Rona Farrow did a brilliant job of exposing this guy, and one properly so, I think, a few of surprises for their reporting. They were focused on one thing. I was focused on Harvey Weinstein, his life, power, and how he used it and abused it, the relationship between the brother, the enablers who made Harvey Weinstein popular. I mean, that, that to me was a different story that I wanted to tell. And the media was complicit. Oh. I mean, you talked about NBC. Do you still feel like they kind of I, were a bit of an enabler there? Oh, I, absolutely. They should have run that story. I think Ronan Farrow had the goods and they, and they denied that. Hmm. And, but it wasn't just NBC. If you go down, the, the reporters who, were, who sought Harvey's favor I want to be invited to your screenings. I want to be invited to your parties. Yes, I'll keep that off the record. Oh, Harvey, you have you have wines, you have talk books. I'd like a book contract. And how many reporters got? And journalists got book contracts. Many did. Joe and Mika did. You know, Rudy right. Giuliani got a book contract. Tim Russett, who produced the bestseller for them, got a book contract. Mm -hmm. Many reporters, page six editor, got a book contract from talk books. I, I did detail all that right. in my book right. but so the press did they know he was abusing women I don't know but did they know he was cheating on his wife you bet 
Did they know he was flirting with women at these parties and after parties? Absolutely. Right. I want to switch gears a little bit, Ken, and talk about some of your other books. Um, going back to one of my favorites, Greed and Glory on Wall Street, The Fall of the House of Lehman, must read for anyone interested in Wall Street. Uh, great book, Three Blind Mice, Microsoft book, World War 3.0, Ted Turner, Googled, Frenemies. How do you choose what to write about? And we'll get to your articles, which are amazing and interesting too, but the well, books themselves can. Well, a book, I mean, to do a book is at least a three-year commitment. So it, it, in that sense, it's like a marriage. You want to be sure you're in love before you take the plunge. So you take some time. People ask me now, what's your next project? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And in part because I need to go through the process of falling in love and being sure that I'm in love and that I really want to commit to three years with, with a new partner. A. B, I see what I do as visiting other planets. And I want to, I want to visit another planet. I want to learn about it. I want to get to know the natives. And, 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 that, and it's a new, fresh experience. And that's what I want, a new, fresh experience that interests me. And each of those books, they're very different that you cited, uh, was really an attempt to visit another planet. So at some point, I'll decide the planet I want to go visit. But it'll be very different than the ones I've visited before. So is there a common thread, a narrative arc? I mean, they're about media and power. What is the denominator? Well, many books, starting with Three Blind Mice, after I did Green Glory on Wall Street, which was Wall Street, I did Three Blind Mice. Then I did a series of books that related in some way to, to the media, including Google. Yes. Uh, including Frenemies, which is about advertising, but uh, how advertising is, is funds media, uh, so much of media. Uh, Harvey Weinstein is not media. There's a, a slice of media in it, but it's a different kind of book. So I'm not wedded to the idea that it'll have to be a, a media book. We'll see. I, I just don't know. But media for the last quarter century has been my focus. What's so compelling about media, Ken? Interesting people, power, uh, disruption. It's going through this enormous change. And, and when I did Three Blind Mice, it was about the three television networks that were being disrupted by cable, a new technology. When I wrote about Google, the Google book in 2009, I was writing about it. The digital world was disrupting cable and all the other uh, traditional media. and. So a theme of what I've been doing for the last quarter century is disruption, and, and that interests me. Harvey, in many ways, the Harvey book is, is a, a book about disruption. The movie business is going through enormous disruption today. They talk about streaming, what happens mm -hmm. to movie theaters? One can go on and on. What happens to the big pay that, that actors and, and actresses get if you don't have the same revenues coming in from movies? Um, independent movies, Harvey was a pioneer in them. I mean, the kind of movies he was making for Miramax and the Weinstein Company are now being made by, by Netflix and, the, and Amazon. So the world changes all the time, and changes is, is always interesting to me. Well, let me turn those questions back to you. Um, what do you think is going on in the movie business? I mean, besides the fact the stream's coming, is here, I should say. What does that mean for us as a society and a culture? I mean, people say movie theaters are dead. I say, well, young people still need a place to go to get away from their parents. Um, clearly, movie theaters haven't done a very good job of getting better, while as home theaters and your TV's gotten better and better and better and better. Is there no more money for Hollywood, though? You've got a streaming glut right now because it's all being funded by Netflix, but that's gone away in 2022. What do you think is going to happen? If I, I knew and I invested money in media, which I don't, uh, I, would, I would be very wealthy. Mm. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, I know some of the questions, though. Mm. And, and when, when people, if you talk to people in the movie theater business, they say people want a community, a sense of yeah. going out and being in some place. And, and we have to do a better job of not just serving bad popcorn, but maybe meals and, and more comfortable seats, et cetera. 
Is that true? Will that work? I don't know. They've been saying that for a long time. They have the been, and it hasn't, it hasn't so far worked. Right. On the other hand, I, when I look at my own experience, I have a big 70-inch TV. It's very comfortable at home to be able to watch, and it's very comfortable to be able to you know, binge watch things. Right. On the other hand, when you look at what Netflix is going through now, where they're suddenly saying, we have to have ads. One of the reasons I love Netflix is that I wasn't interrupted by ads. Well, now they're saying we, you have to be interrupted by ads because we need, without it, we don't have the, the finances to be able to do this. And they may be saying that binge watching is a thing of the past, mm -hmm. that we have to go back to the future and, and have once a week segments that we, we can better promote them and get people to watch them rather than if we allow someone to watch House of Cards over a weekend. You know, it's interesting, for, for many years, decades, Ken, they always said that Hollywood was this very defined culture and no one could come in and figure out how to do it. But it seems like Netflix has, Amazon to a degree, Apple's making pretty good stuff, right? So it, yeah, the morning can, show other people is fabulous. can do it, right? Yeah, they can, and, and whether, but, but then, you know, if you look at Netflix, I remember profiling Reed Hastings in Netflix some years ago, and I thought they had the holy grail, but they were basically buying product for someone else. They were licensing Warner Brothers and ABC and Fox's content. Then they decided to spend $10 billion a year on, on creating their own content. And, and suddenly they did, but now they're finding they spent too much money on content, so they had to raise the monthly price of Netflix to the point where maybe they start Churn starts comes in and they start losing customers the way cable loses customers. And so now they're saying, oh, hold up. Maybe we need ads. Maybe we can't do binge watching. Maybe we have to do it a different way. And, and now, you know, Warner Brothers now comes along and they say, unlike Disney, which decided no longer to sell its content to Netflix, we're going to sell it because it's great easy money for us to do that. Right. You know, it's interesting, during a market share grab like that, which essentially is what was going on with Netflix in particular, but also with Apple and Amazon, you want to be a customer, um, which is to say you just get all this stuff. And the other customers, by the way, are the showrunners. It was an incredible time to be a showrunner. I mean, it's like... You bet. Right? You saw and they're those, rare. Right, exactly. So they had it good. I want to ask you about a couple of your articles signature articles, famous articles that you did, or things that came from them. Um, first of all, your article about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, um, I think the point's been made that it wasn't necessarily so damning initially, but it did have a point that said, where does this stuff come from? And it triggered John Carreyrou to begin his work. John Carreyrou did a brilliant job of exposing Elizabeth Holmes. I did not. Uh, yes, I had some skepticism, and John picked up on that. I said her ex I asked her six different times. I described my New Yorker profile of her. I said, "Tell me what happens to the nanotainer of drops of blood when you put it in your machine." And six different times, she gave me gobbledygook, which I described as comically opaque. Mm -hmm. But I did, uh, and so John picked up on that, and a brilliant job he did. But I didn't nail her fraud, and he did. Mm -hmm. So when I look back on that, yeah, I did a, a profile of her, but I, I did not produce the goods that he did. Well, that's, that's big of you to say that. I, I, I'm even more guilty, though. You're not guilty at all. I mean, we did a story at Fortune, put her on the cover, and there was a little yeah. skepticism, but not really enough. Um, and she hated the cover line, Ken. It was, this CEO's out for blood, which I'm glad it wasn't more fawning than that. But anyway, right. that, was a, that was a tough episode for a lot of journalists, and it's good that you... We're on the path to it, and as I said, then John picked it up from there. Another one that I want to flag is the story you did, I think, on Barry Diller, where you coined the term information superhighway. Right. Is that right? Talk about that. I, Barry Diller, if you remember um, back, it was one of the first pieces I did under my Annals of Communications at The right. New Yorker. And it was in, it was in 93 in the early, very early infancy of the internet. And Barry Diller left Fox and he had to decide what to do with his career. And he took his laptop, a new Zappo laptop, 
and he, his MacBook, and he took that as a vehicle to try and figure out what to do next. Should he join the cable industry? Should he go back to broadcasting? Should he do something totally digitally? And then what is this home shopping network thing? And he went on his Mac and he would see that people were buying, they bought 26,000 copies of a woman by the name of Diane von Furstenberg's wraparound dresses in one hour. He said, it's two way and I can find out minute by minute who's buying, how much they're buying. Wow, I want to do something digitally two way. And, and so he wound up working with John Malone to create the home shop, or join the home shopping network, become CEO. And, and from that, he said, I think the internet is going to be the future. Digital is going to be the future. And I wrote that piece about his search for the future. I've never gotten more responses to any piece I've ever written than that, because I think people were, are so tuned in to what's next. What, what is that? the mysteries of the future. And, and Barry Diller was, was trying to navigate those mysteries in a very interesting way. All these people that you've interviewed and profiled, I mean, from Barry to Reed Hastings um, and on and on and on here, it's just, it's a lot. And, and I hate it when people ask me, but I'm gonna ask you, which of these people stand out or is there anyone that's sort of above others? Well, one of my favorites, uh, mm -hmm. which is, is a portrait not of a mogul, mm -hmm. but of a journalist. And, and uh, McClandish Phillips was a New York Times reporter. And, and arguably, Gay Talese, who's a great writer, when he was on the Times, when I interviewed Gay about McClandish Phillips, he said, McClandish Phillips was the single best writer, better than me, at the New York Times. So McClandish, and I, and, and I heard what happened to him. I knew he left the Times. And what I learned was that McClandish Phillips had was on a story that the head of the American Nazi Party, who lived in Queens, was actually Jewish. Mm. And he confronted the head of the American Nazi Party in a diner in Queens. And he said, you're Jewish, aren't you? And the head of the American Nazi Party looked at him, fingered the knife at his table, and McClanish Phillips said, my God, he's going to stab me. And he says, if you write that story, I will kill myself. McClandish Phillips goes back to the New York Times, talks to the editors and says, here's the story. They said, wow, what a great story. This is a page one lead story for us in the Times. And he says, but he threatened to kill himself. And they said, look, he's not going to kill himself. It's a great story. And it, it's a great exposure of a, of a guy who says he's Jewish and he's, he's with this terrible organization, leading the terrible organization. So it runs on page one of the New York Times. What happens? The head of the American Nazi Party does kill himself. Mm. What next happens is McClandish Phillips leaves the New York Times, says, this, this is too brutal a business for me. I track him down. He is handing out Christ literature by Columbia University. He's an evangel evangelical Christian leader. I track him down and spend time with him, reporting. A wonderful man. I mean, just a, a devout believer, really believed in what he was doing, believed that journalism was not something that was Christian for him to be doing. And of all the profiles I've done, he it's one I, I, I particularly like doing and, and like forcing myself to expose myself to evangelical Christians, which I normally as a Coney Island kid would not be doing. Uh, and I, I came to have respect for him and what he was doing and what he did. Amazing story. Talk about being a, a Coney Island kid a little bit, and you grew up here in the city. I grew up in the city. I, I was at public schools. Um, I, was, um, I was thrown out of high school in my junior year at Abraham Lincoln High School uh, for stealing passes to get out of the, the building to go to the sweet shop across the street. <laughs> and my parents got a, a, an, an interview with the principal, Abraham Lass, of the high school, and I was there, and I came with a rolled up T-shirt. And he, so, he said, tell me Kenneth, he called me Kenneth, which I hated. Tell me Kenneth, what do you like about Abraham Lincoln High School? 
And I said, well, I like football and baseball, which I play here. He said, tell me, Kenneth, how do you suppose you're going to play football and baseball for Abraham Lincoln High School if you don't attend Abraham Lincoln <laughs> High School? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and he, right. he changed my behavior and changed my life. He, he was a, the great mentor of my life. And final question, Ken. So what is it like working all these years at the New Yorker magazine? What's that been? Oh, it, New York is a great place. I mean, it's a place where you feel like everyone is rowing together. You hand in a piece, and the editor may, helps make it better. The fact checkers correct mistakes and help make it better. The lawyers weigh in and help make it better. The publicity people. You just feel like everyone is rowing together. It, it's a very communal place, and, and it's a pleasure to work there. And you don't know what your next book is. I have no idea. Author Ken Aletta, whose latest book is Hollywood Ending, Harvey Weinstein and the Culture of Silence. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Andy. Us. Enjoyed it. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.